I'm John Motter. I enlisted when I was 19 into the Marine Corps. Um, just like felt pretty aimless and um, it was kind of at the height of the Iraq war and like a lot of my friends from high school were joining and getting hurt and it felt like really important and, and I felt like I had to do something. So I was raised in a military family. My parents were both uh, Navy officers. That's how they met. Um, grandparents, cousins, like all in the military. Uh, lived on a military base in San Francisco when I was a kid. So I had like all that indoctrination um, along with all the stuff like every kid gets. Uh, all the Hollywood movies, the all the big jingoistic films that came out post 9-11. Um, that whole surge in patriotism, so that had definitely impacted me. And growing up, like I, I hadn't really thought I would be anything other than, you know, a soldier of some sort. Um, we're a really poor community, like we're in the heart of coal country. Um, not a lot of opportunity for people, and I think, like, tip a pretty typical story. Like, military is just like mm -hmm. a way out, and a lot of guys. We're taking advantage of that. But also just like an unusually high, I think casually rate for a small town. Like um, two, two of my friends from high school are a year older than me. I, I was on the track team with, they both got hit with IEDs, um, got messed up pretty bad and sent home. You know, this was in like 2000, 2005, 2006. So I remember being at work and just like every single day on the radio, just like little like, news clips of casualty reports like you know two more Americans like killed or wounded in Iraq like every single day. I wanted to go um, active duty Marine Corps infantry just like whatever would I thought would put me closest to the action and danger and everything. Um, so that was May of 2007 and I got to my unit um, 1st Battalion 2nd Marines uh, weapons company in August of that year. Um, I was an assault man and I served as a Humvee driver in my first deployment in Iraq and then as kind of an all-purpose explosive um, detection dog handler slash assault man slash rifle man slash medic in Afghanistan. So I remember the night Obama announced the troop increase, I was on duty that night and we were like, well I guess we're going and we got our uh, ship out date and we were part of that big troop surge in the summer of 2010. And we, we started taking contact literally as soon as we got there. Um, uh, we took casualties you know within the first week or two and then like it was pretty firefights and casualties and IED fines and IED detonations all that stuff was pretty regular after that and it was just very very hairy very kinetic uh, I don't know. The U.S. war in Afghanistan will soon enter its 20th year. Two decades, we've seen an endless loop of news stories. Progress, then setbacks. Lies, then revelations. A new end, and then a new beginning. But for the most part, it has simply vanished from media and politics. No longer discussed at all. However, it has not vanished for those impacted, not for the people of Afghanistan, nor the young men and women sent to fight them. John's experience is, in so many ways, emblematic of the war, pointless, futile, and completely hidden from his own country, which he was told he was there to protect. His story there begins with the troop surge Obama promised would end the war. All it produced was the highest rate of casualties for U.S. troops, an eventual retreat. It's a recurrent experience that represents the absurdity of the Empire's war. Wasted lives on hopeless orders for a purely imperialist mission. So we got to um, the big base in Afghanistan Camp Leatherneck. And we like saw the medevac birds coming in pretty regularly, regularly to Camp Ashton. Right? That was like the first sense we had that this was real and then our whole company shipped out 
to you know, the middle of nowhere. Musa Kela was our AO. Um, that's in northern Helmand province. And like my whole notions of what like how a firefight in combat works was just shattered. It wasn't like anything I expected. Um, this is my first firefight. We left our patrol base. You're decently protected if you're within the villages. You have like a lot of cover and stuff, but like once you go out into the, the fields, you're in wide open and that's usually when what we call the Taliban, but I don't even know who we were fighting, probably just like some warlords. Um, that's when they would usually open up on you. So we went straight from our little base on the edge of the green zone into the fields and pretty quickly started taking contact. Um, I kind of thought you would like know who's shooting at you when you're being shot at and like you don't, like you can't, you can't tell who the hell's shooting at you, you can only tell like a vague direction, especially during the middle of the day, like you can't see muzzle flashes, anything. So we were like relying on our training, like you got to have positive identification, all these things and I'm like looking around, looking around, like not seeing anything and kind of think I see something, so I like start shooting at that and like another squad shooting at something like what the hell are they shooting at so we just start shooting anyway there's nowhere for us to go um, we're all pinned down my squad is just laying low in this field and we're we're shooting back at just like holes in walls at doorways you know windows bushes tree lines like anywhere you think the enemy might be the guy next to me like I heard him yell, he got shot. Um, so I just, I picked up and ran over to him and started treating him. He was hit like two or three times in the legs. While I'm treating my buddy, his like um, legs shattered. But there's nowhere for us to go. We were like in the middle of this field. If we stand up, if we try and go anywhere, like someone else is gonna get hit. I got you. We do end up like just firing a bunch of rounds so that we can egress out of there. We get you know back into a tree line. We think we're safe, and then another, our squad leader gets shot. So then again, we're like stuck in like a little creek bed at this point. We're all just like laying as flat as we can. Same process is repeated. We you know shoot out like whatever ammo we have left and should just like get the hell out of there. Um, at no point this whole day did I see like any enemy. Um, this lasted like eight hours, uh, it was a pretty exhausting day, and that kind of became a normal thing. I would say like once a week, we were repeating something like that for the next couple months. John's unit became part of a major push into so-called Taliban territory, an operation that was supposed to turn the tide of war, allowing for an end to US combat. All it accomplished was further disaster for the Afghan people, and a new signature wound for U.S. troops. Triple amputations. That was another like major operation that lasted like two days. Um, we, took, we took like a few more casualties. Then we took our first KIA. Our, our first Marine was killed um, during that operation, stepped on an IED. Um, another Marine um, lost I think it was a triple amputee um, the day after that. That was the first time we took IED casualties. Taking casualties from like small arms was fairly common, but IEDs were like extremely commonplace. We were averaging like one a day we would find. I mean, we had a, a lot go off on us without casualties too. Um, like a, a few times I had them go off like within a foot or two, um, but just like got that lucky that they were like directional or I had like, I was on like the edge of a wall or something and it was right on the other edge. Maybe two, three weeks in, we took the village of Karamanda and we set up in a compound at the north side of the village. Um, I think we displaced an Afghan family to do that. They just like up and left when they saw us coming and we set up our base within their home basically because we hear the word occupation, I mean, this is the longest war in U.S. history, you know, and I think that, that word doesn't really resonate with people or doesn't ring, the reality doesn't really resonate of what that actually means for the people of Afghanistan. Like, what kind of things did you see that, that really bring that home? Like, as an occupying force, like, what are we doing? We're, 
we're going out into this village, like armed to the teeth, um, searching everyone we come across, um, doing, you know, pat down searches. Um, occasionally we would have to do stuff where we'd have to search people's homes, like look for contraband weapons. We would confiscate weapons sometimes, like even if they think they were allowed to have them, like some like old bolt actions that they just have to like shoot, you know, wild dogs or whatever, protect their, their goats and stuff. Um, everyone got searched, like regardless. Every vehicle we came across would get searched. Um, there's always the threat, you know, I'm sure like as someone who is living under occupation that like we could shoot you. Um, we, again, like we were, we were more disciplined than like most units, like, um, like I'll credit us that much, but that's like, there were still times where I know we like shot unarmed people and I know there were other platoons that definitely did that stuff. Cause like they did not give a shit at all. Like our, our platoon commander and our platoon were like, at least on board with the whole like counterinsurgency hearts and minds idea. So like we weren't trying to make, like we weren't looking to make enemies out of the people, but like it still happens. But like there were other platoons that just like did not give a fuck. And you know, if there was like a firefight, they would shoot like anyone out in the open. Um, and I definitely heard from like friends, friends of my unit, like times they had shot people that when they didn't see a weapon um, and I heard from people who, who were there firsthand in other platoons and squads that guys who were like crazy or just like really undisciplined of just shooting innocent people and unarmed people, people like they knew didn't have a weapon and they shot them anyway. So that kind of like terror was how much it sucks to have people constantly patrolling, you know, your community and viewing you as a threat and searching your stuff and like how traumatizing like that can just be to like constantly be criminalized like that and viewed as the enemy. And all of this was told that there's some greater mission um, for the U.S., right, to protect the U.S. and also to help the Afghan people. And at what point did you start to just say, like, this isn't doing either? After I enlisted, like, I became disillusioned pretty quickly. Um, kind of forgot about the reasons I joined you, after a while. Like, there was definitely, like, a healthy dose of just, like, running out the clock. Like, it's just, like, get these patrols. Like, further on it got, the further on it got, like, the less we cared about, like, even paying back or like having revenge on the Taliban. It's just like, let's get home alive. And I know, I know guys like, even if they definitely like supported the war and like more, more right wing dudes, we were still like doing like search and avoid patrols. Search and avoids uh, a term I coined in Vietnam, I believe that I didn't learn until much, much later, like relatively recently, that's what we were doing. Um, but it's when you go on patrol and, you know, instead of going to like, you know, points A, B and C and going back, you would like go to point A and just say you're going to like B and C. Um, so sometimes, yeah, we would, if we were like really exhausted, um, I remember one time in particular, like we had to do a, this like big 72 hour op and within like the first 20, 24 hours, um, uh, one of our Marines got killed that he was like really well liked. And everyone's like, do we still have to like do like the rest of this mission now? Like this feels like pretty, you know, futile. And we didn't, like we just like went out and like found a tree line, sat down and just like, yeah, we're going here, yeah, we're going here. So I feel like the proof's in the pudding there where it's like, you obviously aren't that committed to the mission if you're like going on patrol and just radioing up fake pause reps and stuff to avoid having to do this stuff. Um, we were just, undermining the orders of our CO and of the broader mission in general, just cause like we were like, it's not worth it. Like this isn't for them. We're just like, you know, little dots on a map or piece on a chessboard, but like, we don't, we don't care anymore. No one was like, this is worth dying for after a few months. Honestly, like the whole, my whole like four years in the Marine Corps just felt like a prison sentence that like, I just gotta like stick it out um, I'll get through this and then I'll get out, like never come back. I'll get my GI bill. I'll be set. And I think had people like really believed in it, like more people would have re-enlisted and we didn't because we were like, this is bullshit.
it's not worth dying for. Trump's reign, the third successive commander-in-chief of the war, is often portrayed as the most restrained in Afghanistan compared to his two predecessors. The vengeful invasion of George W. Bush and the colossal troop surge of Obama. Every now and then we hear of great progress in the peace deal being negotiated with the Taliban, teasing that an end to the war is in sight. But that has always been premised on impossible benchmarks that provide a perpetual excuse for permanent U.S. occupation. Trump, in fact, doubled troop numbers from when he took office, leading to the most U.S. deaths in five years. But that's not the real measure of Trump's legacy. In a stunning feat of savagery, Trump dropped more bombs on Afghanistan and killed more Afghan civilians in both 2018 and 2019 than in any other year of the war, including the immediate aftermath of 9-11, including the troop surge. That body count grows when you add civilians killed by the Afghan forces trained and commanded by the US. Those we're told we must kill and die to put into power can seem indistinguishable from those we're told we must kill and die to keep out of power. Uh, A&A and a and A&P um, that have killed a lot of civilians as well. Um, and I know like how poorly trained they are and how undisciplined they are and just the kind of people we're putting in charge. Like we're not working with good allies, you know, we're working with so, I mean, like, literally, our, one of our A&P commanders was, like, Taliban, like, a year prior. <laughs> and, like, that was, like, how he was so effective at his job. Like, we would go on patrol and be like, oh, I remember you, you're Taliban. It's like, because he was working with them in the Taliban, like, a year ago. And, and then I think the Taliban killed his brother. And he's like, okay, I switched sides now. I'm, I'm with the A&P. And we're like, yeah, that, that's cool. This guy had been, like, fighting with the Taliban his whole life. And, like, you're on our team now. Um, I mean, I found out later because my, my interpreter I'm friends with, he lives not far from here, he was telling me stories that the kinds of like awful people these, like a lot of these commanders were, um, stuff about murdering detainees, um, that was like happening under our nose basically and I had no idea about. These aren't like the good guys, so to speak, that we're training up and handing the country over to. I mean, I'm sure like the average Afghan civilian doesn't distinguish, you know, between any of the people oppressing them. They just like, you know, want the empire out. You mentioned that you were seeing like guards with poppy fields and stuff like that. I mean, I know that there's like a lot of drug use also with heroin and opiates and stuff like that. Did you see any, I mean, did, did anyone question why like the poppy fields were being guarded? I guess it's just because the Afghan farmers were, that was their crop. We weren't like explicitly told like go protect the opium fields, but like if we, if we would cut through an opium field in order, order to avoid, avoid an area that was like more like a trail or a path that was more likely to have an IED on it, we would get like in trouble. The farmers would complain and the officers would complain and be like, don't do that, like stick to the paths. And then of course the Taliban would plant IEDs on the paths and we would get hit by them. Um, so it basically it, it did become that we were essentially like protecting these farmers growing opium and their crops. That, that was definitely like the most absurd thing at the time. Like we know we can defund the Taliban by just like getting rid of these poppy fields. And instead like we were effectively like protecting the poppy fields and the crop. But, and then the irony of like the fact of like guys getting hooked on opioids when we got back um, and then getting criminalized for it. It's like our mission to protect like opium over there. And then we get like thrown in jail or overdose and die on it while we're back home like just full, so probably on like the same opium too, just like coming full circle. That was pretty absurd. Um, a and A and a and were always smoking hash. Um, uh, eventually like a lot of us started smoking hash too. We would get it from them just to like cope with PTSD and stuff we were developing on deployment. That was like definitely against the rules, but we were like, fuck it, you know. So looking back on it a decade later now, John, what are your thoughts? It's still mind-blowing that it's going on. Um, when I deployed, it was already almost 10 years into the war. And I remember being over there, I was like, how is this still happening? Um, the fact that like these wars had just like drug on so long. Like I was in Afghanistan when I was 20, 22, I think, and I was in eighth grade on 9-11. 
And I, I definitely like remember thinking that, um, like, like what the hell? Like I was a child and here I am like still fighting the war. And now it's like been that time period like once more, like almost 20 years now. Like even at the time, some of the guys like didn't have like fresh memories of 9-11, like guys like even a few years younger than me. And now there's people who weren't even born when it happened. It's like, do you, do you know like the excuse that was used to like, or the pretenses to like even have this war? Uh, yeah, it all just feels like completely ridiculous. Um, but also makes perfect sense when you understand the military industrial complex. Like I understand like why we're still there. Like the real Why do you why. think we're still there? Because it's enormously profitable. Um, I think, honestly, I, I think the war is meant to be maintained at this level just indefinitely. You know, if it gets, um, if there's like further escalation, I think that could result in like more pushback from the American people and might end up in like a full withdrawal. Um, but I think at the level right now, like not too many Americans are dying. So like the American people aren't, aren't too upset about it. Um, but we're still dropping like a ton of ordinance. Um, we're still spending a ton of money. Um, so it's, I think it's working out great for defense companies. They're making a killing off of this and they can just probably stretch this out indefinitely. And now it seems like the Afghanistan war has just been reduced to talking points, maybe a question thrown at the presidential debates every now and again. And as you said, it's, it's being maintained at this point for the military industrial complex. What do you think the solution is to end it once and for all? Yeah, I think there should be a full withdrawal of US forces from Afghanistan. Um, no bases, no advisors, um, no CIA funding. Um, I don't think we have any role to play there, um, certainly not a military one. Like, no one who thinks like we should be staying over there has like any concept of what they're talking about as far as war or combat is concerned. Um, and if they did, they wouldn't be for it. I mean, maybe like a handful of like sociopaths still would be, but like they're not gonna, I don't think they're really gonna organize the rest of the population to go fight with them. Listen to the Afghan people, I mean, there's plenty of anti-war groups in Afghanistan that are like do not want more violence, they do not want the Americans there. Um, I feel like those people should have a say, you know, and it shouldn't just be Americans like dictating this is what's best for you. Um, they're the ones who are going to have to like live with whatever the consequences are, so if they don't want you there, you should, you know, take that seriously. I don't know really like what what the solution is, there is, I think that's like up to the Afghan people like what they think justice is. John's story is important, not just because it represents the cruel and senseless nature of the war, but because it represents how we can bring it to an end. Our military and our country is mostly composed of people just like him, working class, heavily indoctrinated children of the empire. His is a story of awakening, of how true believers in the war can completely transform into fighters against it in a country of people who mostly share the same roots and class interests as John Motter, millions share the same potential to rebel against this war for the billionaire class. The Vietnam disaster finally ended because the bipartisan war machine in Washington was faced with both a military defeat abroad and relentless anti-war pressure here at home. Afghanistan has delivered one side of that equation. Only we can tip the scales on the other.